torn from a world of tyrants beneath this western sky. We formed a new dominion. Welcome to uh, Eye on the Square here in Union Square in Somerville. I'm glad you could join us, and I'm glad our special guest is with us today, Wig Zamor, who's the co chair of the Civic Advisory Committee and has a tremendous amount of experience on city planning and uh, urban issues and that. We're so happy you could share those ideas with us today. Wig. Well, thank you. I'm very glad to be here. So, uh, uh, in 2017, now I understand that uh, uh, the MBTA will be opening up a new station. And it'll be right across the street, actually here, uh, part of a multi-million dollar development in the square. So there are many issues, of course, the traffic and the uh, environment. What can you uh, tell us about that project? Well, um, first we fought for the project for a long, long time. Um, Somerville's been the densest city in the state for 100 years or more and uh, had very little transit, just uh, most recently the, the Red Line and Davis Square and a few stations on the edges, but uh, have a really dense population, a uh, population that's diverse and uh, many people that don't have cars, uh, it's quite a hardship not to have some public transit uh, so people can get around without cars if they want to. Uh, so um, community fought very hard uh, during the state's reconsideration of what transit projects to fund in connection with their environmental obligations from the big dig and their environmental obligations to the Clean Air Act and U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. And the Green Line project was basically the last, um, the urban projects were the last big dig projects and the last clean air projects to be taken up by the state. They did the commuter rail and the parking uh, out in the suburbs first, but they always had an obligation to provide some transit in the cities. And the Green Line was always on the list, Green Line to Somerville, and it was just one branch. And so in the early 2000s, uh, the state decided to reconsider whether they would do those projects that had been on the list for so long. And there were some in the state who really wanted to do uh, general economic development project and, and not do the Green Line here or the Green Line in Jamaica Plain, which was also supposed to be restored. And so that required uh, the citizens of Somerville and the uh, elected officials and many, many different groups, people connected with affordable housing, with uh, bicycling advocacy, with environmental advocacy, um, with economic development advocacy, um, all to figure out why it was important for them to have transit. And in many cases, they were concerned about the potential negative impacts of the transit. Um, so we needed to make sure that we uh, backed each of those different groups in um, saying that we would give attention to their issues as we together pushed for um, keeping the Green Line obligation for the state and actually getting going on it. In Jamaica Plain, unfortunately, the community splintered. The bicyclists did not want the transit. Uh, the small businesses did not want the transit because they were afraid of losing some parking spaces. And eventually, City Hall didn't want the transit. The social activists did want the transit, and the environmental activists wanted the transit. But the T backed out, and the Commonwealth of Massachusetts backed out of that Green Line project because the community was split. And our um, advocacy was so broad and so strong that the state um, decided to reinforce their obligation to the Green Line. And during that discussion, um, there was some concern that the state would only serve either Union Square or the other branch, both of which go down existing commuter rail rights of way. And so some people wanted the Union Square branch, which we're talking about today, and the development that will surround it, to be abandoned in favor of the longer branch that was going up uh, through Gilman Square and Ball Square and eventually to Tufts. And we argued that that wouldn't be fair because there was a larger environmental justice community around Union Square. And um, there was also a larger business community historically 
but if it had been hurt by uh, people not being able to get in and out of Union Square very well in the road system. And, and so the economy in the square had declined a lot. And we were very fortunate that the strength of the advocacy was large enough that the state decided to support both branches here, to do a, a small branch to Union Square and to make that one of the first stations built and then to do the longer branch with about six or seven stations eventually going out the length of Somerville Pass Tufts and eventually to Route 16. Yes, I guess it's been almost 30 years really and, and uh, when we go back that far a lot of preference was given to automobiles and we know right. how much money was put into the big dig and, right. uh, and now we find uh, especially with the change in population in Somerville, the younger millennial uh, right. uh, residents, uh, that they favor more healthy approaches such as bicycling right. or walking. Uh, and uh, there's a, a new mix uh, of uh, settlements yep. here in the town. Yep. Well, we have um, by far the most multifamily properties per square mile in the state and the highest ratio. So in Somerville, the housing uh, parcels are three and a half to one multifamily to single family. Chelsea, it's two and a half to one. Uh, no other city is one and a half to one. Cambridge is close, and all the cities have a much lower ratio of multifamily to single family. So that type of housing uh, is able to accommodate generation after generation of people who move to Somerville, um, who may start here before they have uh, jobs or may start their families here. Um, traditionally, Somerville, Cambridge, and Brookline have the highest turnover in population. Uh, that's happened forever in Somerville um, and in Cambridge and Brookline. Um, but the housing accommodates those um, many different generations of people, uh, no matter where they come from. So that, that's a real benefit to the, the diversity here. Gentrification is a concern, too, whether it's Chinatown right. or uh, other parts of the country. And they say that Boston is one of the most rapidly gentrifying right. uh, regions. I right. So many people are attracted to the uh, to the hospitals and the education and the uh, technology, right. uh, that it's a very desirable location and sometimes uh, uh, financially unaffordable to so many. Right. So um, Somerville's um, average income has stayed almost um, equal to the state average income for decades. So our average income hasn't gone up in 30 years, um, at least to the last data that we have. And we're just a little bit below the state average income, which means we're quite a bit actually below um, the average income for Eastern Massachusetts. Uh, and that means that as the housing prices go up, whether it's rent or to buy, you have an average income population. It is a strain on that population. And, and yet I think um, many people value the fact that Somerville is a median income community. So over the last 30 years in state records, especially in Eastern Mass, there has been a huge separation of municipalities by average income in the whole municipality. Many people talk about gentrification and income in terms of the people who've gotten very, very wealthy in our current economy and the people who are poor in our current economy. Um, but they haven't tended to look at the municipality as a whole, and whether that's staying median income, getting poorer than state average, or getting wealthier. So we, we're in an unusual situation where our status as a median income community has been maintained, and that is something that warrants attention as the Green Line comes in. I think people like the way Somerville is now. They like the diversity of, of uh, economic strata, and um, so that is certainly something that could change, even though it hasn't changed, uh, when you look at the citywide income. And uh, by contrast, uh, Cambridge, which used to have 25% higher average income 30 years ago than Somerville, has 75% now. So there, the gentrification has in included an increase in average income. And um, it's even worse in the exclusive suburbs versus the gateway cities in interior Massachusetts, which have not benefited from the great economy in Boston and Cambridge uh, and a few of the suburbs. So if you looked at Winchester compared to Lawrence, for example, 30 years ago, 
Winchester's average income was 50% higher than Lawrence. Now it's hundreds of percent higher than Lawrence, and Lawrence doesn't have a chance. Because as the state has lowered its support for municipalities, as governments tighten their belts, it gives less support to communities. And that's a real struggle for Somerville, um, not because it's a median income community, but because we don't have enough jobs. And the jobs are proportional to the commercial tax base. But for a community like Lawrence, whose average income has fallen dramatically compared to the state, and to be next to neighbors like, like Andover or Winchester, whose average income has gone up dramatically, that's a crisis that we haven't recognized yet in eastern Massachusetts from a, a regional planning point of view or a state planning point of view. So we're in the fortunate position here of, as we consider the development around the new T-stops, and especially in Union Square, we should be able to manage it to keep our median income community and make sure that any additional wealth that comes with the transit, people not having to have cars with more jobs, can be used to offset any additional economic strain on people who have less financial resources. Well, jobs are so important. As you said, uh, Somerville has a history of being residential, uh, and, but we're sitting uh, right on the edge of uh, all that's happening right. in Kendall Square right. and North Point, right. and uh, we're right. also more affordable for the uh, investment and uh, uh, the future of industry uh, that are looking for places because we ha have always had a tradition of manufacturing or right. or. Uh, uh, or food industry. Or, right. Uh, uh, right. So um, up until World War II, 1950, the middle of the last century, Eastern Massachusetts was dominated by manufacturing. Almost all the cities were dominated by manufacturing. And Somerville did have a balance of jobs and housing. Um, and then um, and, and so did Cambridge, and so did Boston. Worcester was a great manufacturing city, Framingham. Um, but Massachusetts lost um, more than half of its manufacturing over 50 years. And uh, so what was more than 40% of our jobs and economy in, in 1950 is now less than 20% of our jobs and economy. And some cities kind of took a time out and figured out where their new jobs and their new economic sectors would come from. And Cambridge, for example, has Kendall Square. Um, it took Cambridge a long time. They could have done that any time after 1950, World War II. They could have made that transition. But it didn't happen until the 1980s and 90s. So for 30 years, they tried to hold on to the manufacturing economy, like us, which was declining. Same thing happened in South Boston, dominated by manufacturing, and Boston more generally. Um, but in those situations where you, you lose your leading sectors, economic sectors, you can't really replace them with evolution, one building at a time or one little company at a time. You have to kind of take a time out and say, okay, where are we going to focus next as a community on making sure we have jobs that balance the residents here and their talents and their abilities and, um, and their ambitions? And so with Cambridge, it was the 80s and Kendall Square, which really changed the dynamics there. And um, Cambridge remains a very diverse community and a very wealthy community now because of those jobs, biotech and high tech. But um, their average income, as I mentioned, has gone up. Boston did the same thing by um, adding um, office space downtown. Um, and here, we didn't do that. So we weren't sure what to do next. And we kept looking back. So Assembly Square, for example, great Ford manufacturing plant, designed by one of the best industrial designers in US history, built, designed most of the great car, car plants in the heyday of car manufacturing, a guy named uh, Albert Kahn. And um, our Ford plant shut down with the Edsel. And we, we didn't know what to do with that piece of property, Assembly Square which is the size of Boston from South to North Station. And so citizens started about 20 years ago thinking how we could help, just as citizens, define uh, a more balanced community that would work better for the whole population who lived here. And, and what we came upon was 
trying to balance jobs and housing. And, and as you know, we're the most imbalanced city in the state. 351 cities and towns, we have by far the greatest shortage of jobs per square mile compared to people who live here per square mile. By far the worst performance in the state. Whereas Cambridge has by far the best if what you want is jobs and tax base. Um, and so with our comprehensive plan, which kind of underlies the, the conversion of these old manufacturing and industrial areas that are going to get some of the transit um, to new land uses, uh, the comprehensive plan for Somerville has focused on creating jobs, but not getting extra jobs, just getting a balance of jobs and people here on creating more housing, but keeping in mind that we want the jobs to catch up with the housing because housing is easy here, but job creation is hard here. So, so we need to put our shoulder to the wheel on the job creation. In the housing, we know we need, we need to pay attention to affordability of housing. And so we've set a goal of 20% affordable in all the new housing. Um, and that, I think, has caught on while we've been working on the Union Square Civic Advisory Committee as a goal maybe that we can hope for citywide, not just in the transformative new development, but citywide with all housing development. So that would be uh, a stake in the ground that no other community has, has tried, and we would be a leader. And we would also, by focusing not just one development at a time, but by focusing on getting a citywide solution that aggressively went after affordability, we would become a leader, but we would also assure ourselves more affordability across the city than any one development or, or, or district could tackle. Um, we and certainly do have areas that, uh, as you say, were industrial and that need renovation and renewal, like uh, like Van Pier and, right. and as you mentioned, even Kendall Square has been a process of 20 or 30 years that didn't just right. happen. Right. Uh, and uh, so there's a uh, great hope. You know, right. But then there are issues, environmental issues of pollution, right. which have already been addressed to some degree, but there are perpetual infrastructure considerations right. and uh, drainage and uh, water control right. Right. and other issues that uh, hopefully uh, development will help us uh, to get the resources to address them. Right. So we have a legacy issue with our water and sewer system. All of our old cities, the... Um, the um, we have combined uh, storm sewer and, and, and human sewer, and our regional infrastructure can't handle that. And so we're under a legal obligation to separate those, which is how everybody would plan things today. And we're hoping to do that uh, simultaneous with the development. Uh, and we have low-lying land. We didn't uh, tackle the Millers River correctly, and, and uh, some of your uh, parish buildings uh, have suffered that, but many other people in Union Square have. Uh, we also have another environmental issue, which is extremely serious, causes a lot of premature mortality and a lot of disease, and um, underlies our real focus on healthy transportation. So clean transit systems, ability for people to walk and bike, and, and also helping people who are mobility impaired to get to these um, assets. So we're, as Boston and Cambridge's economies transform, they used the major highways and the major diesel commuter rail to service those economies. And Somerville bears a larger share of those highways and diesel rail trips than any other community in the state. And we have the premature lung cancer and heart attack mortality that you would expect to be associated with those environmental burdens, which are really for the benefit of the region and not for the benefit of Somerville. Um, less than 5% of our residents or workforce use the commuter rail or the major highways. It's almost all people coming through. And so we use that environmental health concern in advocating for why we really needed the transit. And um, that was something the state had no answer for because they knew that they had built I-93 through Somerville after the Clean Air Act of 1970 with full insight into the air pollution violations that were going to happen for those people who live in Mystic Housing or Ten Hill or States Avenue. They knew that the lead was higher than federal or state regulation. They knew that the carbon monoxide was higher. 
they knew that the particulate matter was higher. And that was the only highway segment they went ahead with in Massachusetts in violation of the Clean Air Act. So they knew that that legacy burden had been imposed on us and that we had not benefited from the transit where everyone else in the state had stopped highway building, including Boston. And it's one of Boston's finest moments that Governor Sargent canceled all highway building except for Somerville and shifted all that money to transit and, and built a green corridor um, to, and, and some clean electric transit. Now, I see Tufts has just done it recently, has it a study of the uh, particulates and uh, emissions yeah. uh, on a highway running right. through some of those. Right, right. So we initiated that study, and we did the major parts of the design of that study. Um, Somerville Transportation Equity Partnership is uh, fortunate to have Tufts Medical School, um, Tufts Environmental Engineering, uh, doctoral students from Harvard School of Public Health, BU School of Public Health, all working on that, that research funded by a National Institute of Health and Environmental Protection Agency, U.S. Housing and Urban Development, Kresge Foundation. And we have done some cutting edge, real hardcore environmental epidemiology that uh, has broken new ground in studying highway pollution gradients and cardiovascular inflammation near our highways. But we've also worked with Chinatown and Dorchester. We're doing work in Chelsea now. So we're trying to um, work with the other communities that are affected by these regional transportation burdens. Now you've selected the Redevelopment Authority, seven packages of uh, land here in the square. And uh, I think that there's a, uh, a desire to come up with a, uh, an overall vision of right. how the seven, uh, not just uh, the D2 par parcel that uh, we have a station will be built right. in 2017. Yep. So Union Square is a little bit unique. Most of Somerville is either pretty much fully built out and people want to retain the character, the physical character of the neighborhoods and the small town centers. Um, and then parts of Somerville that we're manufacturing that we talked about earlier are pretty much all empty. So Assembly Square was an example of pretty much all empty blank slate. Union Square is half and half. And um, that uh, gives us an opportunity for a much richer uh, city center long term, but it adds a little bit of complexity because we want to do the new things um, that will connect with the transit really well uh, and have jobs there uh, and, and help our small businesses in the square at the same time. We want to have some housing there, some, some affordable housing there. We're, we're desperately short of open space in Somerville, the shortest in the state per thousand residents, about two acres per thousand residents, Philip and and Ann did a great uh, presentation earlier this week at the Civic Advisory Committee on Open Space. And um, we need with these developments to also include open space. So we, we're going to add those new parts on the empty space or the underutilized space of Union Square and also Boynton Yards next to Union. But we need to do it in a way that respects the fabric and the people already here because we're not doing all new here. We're, we're going to take the best of what we've got and hope to integrate it with the best of what will be new. That's wonderful. And it is a complex and involved uh, uh, process. Yep. And we do have a, or you do, the Civic Advisory Committee have a website. It's Union Square Futures. And uh, it tries to keep us up on uh, what's going on, not, not just in our own Civic Advisory Committee, right. but also in other groups such as Union Square Neighbors or Union Square Main Streets. And certainly one of the major uh, websites is Somerville by Design, right. as well as uh, concerned citizens uh, that are in Union United Somerville. Right. Uh, right. So really all of these websites are great resources uh, for updating and keeping track uh, of what's happening, right. and we're very grateful for all the volunteer time that the members of the Civic Advisory and the other committees have put in uh, to uh, learning about the future here right. and the very historic Union Square Somerville. Right. Thank you very much, Wig, and I hope Thanks you'll for me. come back and uh, tell us more. There's lots to learn, and I, every time I talk to you, I learn something new okay. every day. Thanks. Yep, thank you.
torn from a world of tyrants beneath this western sky. We formed a new...